Hello, and welcome to another episode of LGO TV Big Talk. And why big talk? Because I hate small talk. So my promise to my audience members is that I will bring you only the most interesting guests who are doing the most interesting things, and I'll actually have interesting conversation with them. And my guest today is one of the most interesting people I've ever had the pleasure to read about. I've just finished his new book, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, and I am excited to have on the show today, Dr. Sanford Greenberg. Dr. Greenberg is chairman of the Board of Governors of the John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University's Wilmer Eye Institute. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, and he's a trustee emeritus of the Johns Hopkins University and Johns Hopkins Medicine. President Clinton appointed Dr. Greenberg to the National Sciences Board. He served as chairman of the Rural Health Care Corporation. He was the founding director of the American Agenda, an organization established by Presidents Carter and Ford to identify for President George H.W. Bush the six most urgent problems confronting the nation and to recommend bipartisan solutions. He's the co-editor of, of, of the book, The Presidential Advisory System, and the author of Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. Dr. Greenberg holds degrees from Columbia and Harvard, and he was a Marshall Scholar at Oxford. But I think probably, and I don't know this for sure, but based on his book, his favorite titles are probably husband, father, and grandfather. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. 100% correct. So I read with great delight in your book about the day that you met Sue. <laughs> Sixth grade, you saw her across the room, and yet you still didn't talk to her for years. <laughs> That, that's correct. I was, uh, you know, it's it's tough to uh, talk to people you idolize, and during those years, that's what I did with Sue. And uh, you know, in addition to being shy, but as you also know, after sixth and seventh and eighth grade, toward the end of eighth grade school had a spelling contest sponsored by the Buffalo Evening News. And the two runner-ups, that is Sue and me, had to spell silhouette. She went first and misspelled it. I was then impaled on the horns of a dilemma, as they say. Do I spell it correctly and possibly embarrass her and Lord knows what else would happen to my uh, beautiful potential girlfriend. Uh, or do I be true to myself and I uh, decided to do the latter and spelled it right. That brought her closer to me and brought me to her attention, which then played out in high school because we went to the same high school together as well. <clears throat> and in 10th grade, I asked her to go out to the annual cancer charity ball. And when she accepted, I knew it was a seminal moment in my life. And we've been together ever since that moment. She was your Bashert, as my grandma yeah, would say. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Now, she and I actually worked in the Clinton White House at the same time. I didn't know her, obviously, because I was a young, you know, nobody. But uh, she and I, were we were there at the same time. But you and I actually share something else in common, which is that we each left law school to work in the White House. <laughs> That's very good. Yes, it's true. It's yes. true. Yes, yours was for a fellowship, the White House Fellowship, a an exceptionally uh, uh, difficult program to 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 which to be accepted. Mine was because I dropped out as a young, optimistic. I believed there was nothing that was wrong with this country that couldn't be right with this country. Believer in Bill Clinton in the same way that you were a believer in JFK. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I ended up in the White House helping create the AmeriCorps program. You ended up in a Detroit hospital having your eyes picked into with pickaxes. Yes. Quite rudimentary, quite a rudimentary uh, uh, surgical technique. So 
you're in college, you have, you are, you are, you've, you've got the girl of your dreams back home in Buffalo going to school. You are um, in college, you are roommates with Art Garfunkel, who at and, the time and, was- in, And Jerry Spire. And Jerry Spire. And, 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 and everything is terrific. And your eyes then start to get cloudy, steamy, misty. Yes. A doctor back home gives you some drops. You think everything's going to be great. And it wasn't. Yeah, it uh, certainly wasn't. I entered my junior year with 2020 vision or close to it. And by the end of the year, I had zero, zero vision because of the misdiagnosis of this one particular ophthalmologist who gave me topical steroids, which as it turned out over time, induced glaucoma and that was my fate. And that eventually led to blindness. It led to a, it led to you being back in Buffalo, dropping out of junior year, yes. walking out of your exams. And then Art Garfunkel comes to visit you yeah. and you go on this walk where he basically <laughs> doesn't let you settle for a life that is less than the life that you could live. Yes, that's so a, tell I, us a little bit about that. Tell us a little bit about that moment, that walk. Well, Arthur and I used to stroll down <clears throat> College Walk at Columbia with nothing but great ideas to discuss. And we knew that we had it all. Arthur came to Buffalo and he thought perhaps we'd have a wonderful time walking. But of course, he had a hidden agenda, which is to try and persuade me to go back to the university. And I was not in the mood to even consider it when we first started the walk. But over time, as things unfolded, uh, he kept insisting on this pact we had made before we became roommates. And the pact was simply that if one of us was an extremist, the other would come to his aid. And he started talking about that and I didn't know where he was going. But near the end of the walk, he said, Sanford, uh, I don't think you understand what I'm about. You don't get it. I said, Arthur, I get it. Three non-committal words, of course. He said, you know, we made an agreement. And I said, that doesn't count. Not relevant. He said, it is relevant. It's the essence of what our friendship has been based on. And he said, I don't think that you have to come back, although I think for yourself you do, but I need you there. You're my best friend, aren't you? I said, yes. And so once again, there was this conflict, uh, was I really doing part of paying heed to our solemn covenant or was that just common talk? But he certainly got me thinking a great deal. He talked more about philosophy and the Greeks that we studied in literature, things like greatness and fame and tragedy and heroism. And by the end of the walk, I was almost persuaded that I should return. I told him, of course, that my mother had an option for me, that is to go work for my father who 
was a junk dealer and he became a little snooty and said, you're going to work in a junk shop? I said, yeah, what's wrong with that? He said, oh, well, nothing. I said, well, Arthur, you know, the social workers have told me that the options I really have are making screwdrivers, caning chairs, or becoming a justice of the peace in the hinterlands of Western New York. And I said, none of those appeal to me. You'd even gone out and visited the blind justices with Sue. With, with Sue, right. This uh, social worker insisted. Was, they were out in Batavia, New York. And I came back reeling from that experience, and it made my conviction rock solid, conviction that I would not accept a life of mediocrity. I felt that I wanted to do something that was helpful to other people, to the common good, and that had always been the way I was raised. So certainly pursuing those other occupations would not lead me to where I needed to go, although the place where I needed to go was extremely ephemeral. I was struggling with, in the first instance, to go back or not. And I have to thank my girlfriend, Sue, who I thought would leave me. Don't forget, at that time, as you know from reading the book, I was a dropout. I had no money. I had no eyes. And I had no future. And I felt very much alone in the hospital room, except that my mother was sitting at the front of the bed. So, but she stayed with me. And that's why she's the center of gravity of this book in my life. See, she had a choice whether to accept me in my then deformed condition or seek another partner. And yet she chose to stay with me. Mine, on the other hand, was not a choice. I had to live with my blindness and that was that. So that moral choice she made, as Robert Frost said, made all the difference. The way that you tell the story of you and Sue in the book is is, is incredibly beautiful. I, uh, I kept waiting for you to get to the part where you explored a conversation where you asked her why she chose to stay. And I, I, I was, I have to say, on the one hand, a little disappointed that you didn't. And on the other hand, so happy that you just kept that conversation to yourself. I thought that that was, you know, it, it is, it, it is so uh, emblematic of the of the respect with which you hold her and the relationship. I thought it was it was it was really beautiful. Uh, I also liked the uh, the the quote that you have from Herman Hess, where you said, "God does not send us despair in order to kill us; He sends it to us in order to awaken us to a new life." And I think you 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 use the words that you were either pathetically defiant or quite possibly delusional. Was <laughs> of course the phrase that you used that you were going to return to Colombia, you were going to marry Sue, and you talk about the seed that was planted that has the potential to grow, and the seed that was you know placed there by by Arthur, uh, that you were going to come back. There was you know there there's no other way. But I think that seed also, I think that there are multiple seeds that came from childhood from from before you growing up in a home that was that was uh shaped by a family that was imprinted by escape from nazi germany uh that uh it also happened during this moment of deep love of country uh and 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 then the best you know the, the all the talk of the best and the brightest from jfk and the white house i think there were all these factors that went in that became these seeds and also you were at 
Columbia, where you were learning um, physics from Leon Lederman. You were you took Mark Van Doren's last class. You your art, anthropology teacher was Margaret Mead, for goodness sakes. I mean, as I was reading uh, uh, a professor after professor, I, I, I mean, Richard Neustadt's presidential power was shaping to me in graduate school. I, I have a master's degree in political management and an undergraduate in, in government and political science. And I still have his book on my shelf on me. And, you know, here, low these 30 years later. So I think that there are all these seeds that have that were planted all throughout and 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 Arthur Goffer, Arthur and Sue were almost the fertilizer on those that really had you this had you to say you know there is no other way I have to go back I can't I, I can't live this life of mediocrity I'm not going to you know be a blind justice of the peace and cane chairs and make screwdrivers and yet you you did so much more Right. So so where does where, where does the drive that I'm not just going to live a life that's not of mediocrity, but and not just a life that's of purpose, but a life that is going to impact the maximum number of people I possibly can there. There there has to be ego or confidence or maybe it's blind delusion, uh, you know, the, the pathetic defiance that goes into that. Where does that that where does the ability to dig into that person come from? That's a profound question. And I wish I had all the answers. I could tell you this, that uh, I was born, as you know, from the book in a poor section of Buffalo. Uh, and while we were impoverished, we still lived in a flimsy wooden house, so we were away from the elements, and my father, who escaped from Germany from the Nazis in 1939, entered the United States thanks to his brother, Penniless, and he was a tailor, and a mm -hmm. good one, and so he was able to bring in enough for our sustenance. He, there were a few sweet memories. One was when he suspended a stick of gum over my head and told me that it was coming from heaven. Uh, but those sweet memories vanished all too soon because he died mm. when I was five. And he left my mother, Sarah, with $54 and three children under the age of five to raise. She went to see a social service agency and she asked for her help. And they said they'd be perfectly happy to provide help so long as she separated her three children and put them in three separate orphanages. That was not anything she would consider. You know, she didn't laugh a lot. But when she did, it was all the more pleasing to the three of us. She she was a reserved and quiet, thoughtful, deliberate, and as the Israelis say, she was like a Sabra, tough on the outside, sweet on the inside. But one thing she had was the skin for grimness, which unfortunately followed her throughout her life. But how she lived and how she persisted without help after my father died. I do not know. And she never gave me any sermons, no advice, no review of homework. I just saw the way she lived. And uh, I must have incorporated some of those traits, perhaps by osmosis or just hanging around 
She married some years later to my father, Carl, who was a junk dealer, not a particularly glamorous business. Carl was stronger and more powerful than I was in many, many ways. One day, a disgruntled employee hurled a brick at him, hitting him in the eye, which of course necessitated his receiving a prosthetic eye. Carl, Carl was made of iron because he had to be. And I worked with him in his junk shop and I have never seen anybody work as hard as he did. In the winter, in Buffalo winter, he would be outside all day carrying on his business. In the summer, there was no air conditioning. And so he would be devoured by the blazing sun. My grandmother, Pauline, was eight years old when a broken spring burst into her eye. And just like my father, Carl, she needed a prosthetic. I see it now as an obscene irony after what happened to me. You know, being with her was almost too much as though you weren't worthy of it. Hmm. When she hugged you, it was like being anointed. And you left feeling stronger and more powerful. She, more than anyone else, gave me the confidence that still remains with me. Her death took something sacred from me, but also left behind something sacred too. That's where I came from. That's beautiful. That is, that is, uh, you know, as I was reading the book, I, I was struck by the fact that you have lived a life with giants, you've walked among giants, you've studied with giants, you've done business with giants. And I think the only way to be able to do that is to come from giants. But I think too often in this world, we define giants just by the like bigger, better, faster, more fancier titles when there are so many giants among us. My my uh, grandfather had polycythemia, a rare blood disorder, and he had his first stroke at 41. Mm-hmm. And my mo- my grandmother had to learn how to drive from Brooklyn into the city to help run his business, which was making coats or ma- making buttons for the coats for a big and tall man's coat factory. Mm-hmm. This is you know at a time when women didn't do this, and I I I, I think that coming from strength teaches us there's so much strength that's within us that we don't even know until we have to dig deep for it and i i I love how you tell the story uh throughout about the roots and where you came from and and how that 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 pushed you to 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 know that there you know that there's always more it's it's almost macabre the way you tell the story about the about the prosthetic eye from from your grandmother and from carl and and you know the 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 beggar on the street who was blind and it's almost like it 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 was it was written I don't mean to say this right after Yom Kippur, but it's almost like it was written in the book long before you even had a choice that this was going to be a a, a major part of your life. And so I I, I think that that's it, it's it's wonderful. But this 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 tour de force of will that you have, your your determination, which which led you back to school, it wasn't without waves of self doubt and waves of pessimism. In those moments, was it Sue? Was it Arthur? Was it the 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 history of these the the strong individuals, the giants in your family? Where did you? How did you? How did you get out of bed on the days where it was? It felt almost too much. 
Now that was a very insightful set of comments, I must say. You're Thank right. you. You're right. You're right about giants. Those four people I spoke of surely were in my mind, and I learned whatever lessons in life I needed to learn from them. What got me out of bed? I think that when I was in Detroit Sinai Hospital in 1961, my eyes newly dead, I made a promise to God that I would do everything I could for the rest of my life to make sure that no one else should go blind. My grieving mother sat next to me as I made that promise. And of course, it was naive, idealistic, even adolescent. But that's what happened. I think the best plans are often naive and adolescent. <laughs> <laughs> optimistic. I'm, I, I, I often think that sometimes we do things not because we're worried about failure, but because we're so naive to think that failure is not an option. <laughs> Just sort of go forth and do it. Yes. That's excellent. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you've you you have 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 had a life of entrepreneurship and 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 uh, public policy, social change. If there's <laughs> what's more naive and optimistic than that? <laughs> I confess. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, so, so you're back to school and, and I would love for you to tell the story about that fateful subway ride when you were out in the middle of Manhattan and you were with your roommate, uh, Arthur Garfunkel. And he said, no, 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 I'm going to stay. You go back alone. Yeah, it was, um, it was a very, uh, frightening moment to say the least. We were both in midtown Manhattan and he had always taken me back to the dormitory so I could meet a reader. In this case, the reader was Michael Mukasey, hmm. who has remained a friend all these decades. But I argued that if I couldn't get back, that my career would be doomed. And Arthur said, well, you don't understand, Sanford. I've got a sketch due for the Seagram building tomorrow morning. And we discussed or debated the issues, his issues, my issues. But in the end, he just walked away, abandoned me. And I would say that was a frightful moment in my life. <laughs> I think I think there are a lot of people who have full vision who are afraid to do this. So I think that is, I think frightful. I imagine bowel shaking is probably a yeah. closer, more accurate term. That's, that's a fair, fair <laughs> assessment. Um, so I inserted myself into the rush hour crowd to get me over to Grand Central Station to get the uptown local back to Columbia. But that was more than... I had bargained for. And when I was able by the route I just mentioned to get to the bottom of the entire subway system, uh, I started doing things that were very hurtful, painful to me, and probably embarrassed a lot of people. My, one of the things I did best walking with my arms extended was to look like a sleepwalker or a drunkard. Right, because at this point, you'd already refused the cane. You'd refused the dog. You just you told them, I, I refuse. I'm your rather aggressive social worker telling you, again, there seems to be a theme with social workers. Your family's giving you bad advice, right? <laughs> this is yeah. a theme. You, you, you refused to define yourself as blind, and you walked out. 
So yeah. you're you're on the street without anything showing everyone around you that you're blind and you're stumbling around. So yeah, people must have thought you were you were drunk. Yes, I, I am convinced that that's the case. And after hitting a very large column, my head started to bleed. Hmm. And then when I went through a turnstile, uh, other parts of me started to bleed. And I suddenly walked into something very soft, a woman's breast. Oops. I, I would say that's a big oops. Yes, absolutely right. Now, I can tell you that was as though my life had ended right there. And, uh, but it turned out she was very nice. And the first thing she did was wipe the blood from my forehead. And she said, you know, you seem like a nice boy. And I thought to myself, I used to think I was a nice boy. Was I still then when this darkness had brought me down? In any event, she started walking away and she said, I think it's hardest at first. Take care. And feeling relieved that this cataclysmic event in my mind would not really happen. I rushed away from her and stumbled over a stroller with a baby in it and wound up with my upper body extended over the greasy, dirty, oily tracks. And that was another moment, uh, existential moment, because initially, my reaction was to please beg the Lord to have one of these trains sever me because that would end everything I was going through. I was trying to fake it. Mm, you wanted to end the torture. You wanted to end the burden. You wanted to not have Sue feel like she was stuck, like all of the things that you that you were kidding your mother who was grieving for your eyes. It, like it just you wanted to take yourself and all of them out of out of out of your misery, it seemed Ab like. Absolutely right. The you pointed out something that has been an issue for me for decades. And that is, and I'll give you this example, which when my mother was sitting next to me in Detroit and next to the hospital bed, when I awakened, my first thought was, my God, my mother is seeing her eldest son go blind, his eyes. Hmm cut open. That pain was unbearable. I could not, it had nothing to do with my eyes or anything else. It was just my reaction. And knowing, of course, what a difficult life she had to have this now thrown on top of her. Mm. You know, after I wrote the book, I came across these lines from Samuel Barber, which I wish I had used in the book. Uh, Samuel Barber says, ah, sore was the suffering borne by the body of Mary's son. Sore still to him was the, mm -hmm. grief, was the grief which for his sake came upon his mother. It, back in the subway, I was able to get through a couple of turnstiles. I bumped into suitcases and briefcases and coffee cups and little children and people in business suits because one of the ways in which I 
maneuver down there was to ask questions constantly and um, very often I was afraid after that first incident that I would be bumping into another woman <laughs> uh, that, that that would have been very unattractive it seemed to me so I was able to get to the shuttle cross town and finally got to the local up to Columbia and when I sat down I was surely bloodied and exhausted but a thought forced itself into my mind and that is that my grandmother who came from a little nowhere place in Eastern Europe somehow with one eye got to London where she operated a candy store and then took a long journey across a cruel ocean and when she finally landed in Buffalo she was exhausted and remained ill the rest of her life but despite her illness I, I'd like to use your term to me she was a giant when I got out of the subway I bumped into a man who said oops excuse me sir and of course it was Arthur he had followed me the entire way and he said I knew you could do it but I wanted you to know you could do it uh, I will tell you that that moment more than any of the others I've reflected upon was the turning point in my life it was the episode that defines me it defined me then and it defines me now because I reasoned I'm sure fallaciously that if you could get through the New York City subway system blind your options your opportunities were limitless and that's the way I've lived my life I think you became your own giant that day <laughs> <laughs> I I don't think so but you know what can I say when did you you talk in the book about how you always are dressed like as sharp as a newly minted coin and for those who are watching this on video they can see it for those who are not watching this the bespoke suit the lustrous tie the pocket square the not a hair out of place the, you you write about how your your wallet never lost the leather smell because you would never carry anything that was so worn and you you that you that you have this this uh, uh, you know idea of uh you know of, of how you put yourself out into to the world where did that were you always such a sharp dresser were you did you always have yourself put so put together or did this come you know as the frontal lobe started forming later <laughs> when did this happen uh, it happened uh, it was slowly congealing in my mind but it really took force when I went home and was recovering from a surgery and you see my entire life has been a struggle to regain my dignity mm. my wholeness as a human being because when you go blind you are eviscerated emasculated and it's a horrific feeling and you have to deal with the blindness every day every hour every minute the only rest you get is when you sleep when you wake up in the morning the first step out of bed is automatically goes into a pool of stress hmm. uh, but that's not to say that the other positive forces that they didn't overcome this they did overcome those feelings 
And I think there's one other very important thing that happened to me once again because of Arthur. We first met in the fall of 1958 and we became close friends. One of those things, you use the word beshared. It seemed to me that that was the case here, but after a humanities class, he walked me out to, uh, he did, I walked with him, I could still see. And he pointed to this little patch of grass on Amsterdam in 118. And he said, Sanford, look at that patch of grass. Look how light illuminates the beauty and complexities of its colors. I was a kid from Buffalo who came to the Big Apple. And uh, I knew that my other friends there would be talking about women, politics, sports. But to have someone approach you and urge you to look at a measly patch of grass I knew then that something enormous was being offered me. Mm. I certainly didn't know how great that offer would be. But that little experience transmogrified my life so that my view of nature and actually the way in which I experienced life changed completely. That's what Arthur and I share is this insatiable love of life, of nature, of people. And for decades now, when we speak regularly, which we do, he will always tell me about what it was like when he walked into the streets of New York and he would describe it in great detail. And I learned to do the same. And I carved out a philosophy. It took me a long time, but it started there. And the best way I can describe it to you uh, is through a quote of Albert Einstein. Two words in that quote I'd like to reflect upon. The quote itself is the most beautiful experience we can have is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion which stands at the cradle of true art and science. Hmm. Those who do not know it can no longer marvel, can no longer wonder, is as good as dead and his eyes are dimmed. This notion that you could not wonder, you could not marvel, well, if you can't, you miss the magic of daily life. This unbelievable, magnificent, gargantuan essence, the beauty and the joy, which can be uncovered within all things on the day that we encounter something exciting. For example, walking on vacation with a person you love. Or, in my case, standing on the banks of the Potomac, which is right outside my home, and waiting for something extraordinary to happen. And it always does. There is it's I'm so fascinated by the sliding door concept of life 
right? Like if you hadn't been in that sixth grade class with Sue, if you hadn't met Arthur your freshman year of Columbia, it's it. I know it makes no sense to, to think about if you hadn't gone to that eye doctor and been prescribed those drops, you know, what life would be like. And one of the things that I, and I found myself pondering that I was reading the book, but I love how towards the end of the book, you, you, you sort of do a, a, a you have a tally, right? You're like, here are all the things it's taken from me. And then there's a chapter about here's all the things that's given me. And, and this quote makes me think about that in terms of, we all spend so much of our time trying to have certainty where you have lived so much of your life with uncertainty. And because of that, you've been able to dream and to imagine and to break barriers that you might not even consider possible, or you might not even have even approached if you didn't have to deal with that uncertainty every single day. And I, I think that, that, that the story is told so beautifully in the book. And, 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 you know, you, you, I do have to take issue with one part of it where you talk about how much uh, Arthur uh, has given to you in your life. But as you describe walking into New York City and, and having him give you in great detail all the little bits of it, I would say that you probably contributed pretty greatly to his songwriting as well, which is so poetic and so beautiful and really captures the human spirit. But I think that the exercise of going through and being somebody else's eyes probably built that muscle in him as well. So I just, I took issue a little bit. <laughs> very, I never thought of that. It's a very keen observation. And I have to think about that. Mm. Yeah, you need to call him and tell him he owes you. <laughs> <laughs> so he's uh, so so. In addition to being the, the the godfather for your children, your the the book, Hello Darkness, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, is available today in audiobook, and he has narrated it. Yeah, the whole thing, beginning to end. It's on. It's on Audible, and that's a very this is an exciting day for me. And uh, I tend to, as you know, my wife would call me a Pollyanna. But I do know that this gift of life is something beyond measure. When I was 30, I went to my internist and I said, doctor, I would like you to promise me that if I have a terminal illness, you will help me end it. And he said, yes, I will be happy to do it. But let me tell you my experience. I have many patients who have cancer, some terminal, some other others not. And he said, the moment they're given the news, they begin clinging to life in ways that are unimaginable. Two doors down from me lived Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. For 40 years, I walked past her door in the morning on the way to work and upon my return. And we became very good friends 40 years ago. And I think that she shares the same sensibility that Arthur and I share a beautiful, beautiful heart and soul and a contributor to society like no one else. Absolutely. Sue and I went to pay respects in Statuary Hall on Capitol Hill on Friday. And it was so moving and yet so impossible to have happened. Mm -hmm. The week before she died, well, this goes to the End Blindness Awards 
Justice Ginsburg has been an ardent supporter of me in all my various activities since we first met, way before she became a Supreme Court Justice. And I found it very difficult to be standing there next to her casket knowing that the world has been deprived of one of the great people in history and that she has left such a major vacuum in, in our culture, in our society, that I want to just take a moment for everyone to realize what she was like as a friend, no one better. You know, to have a Supreme Court justice write the foreword to your book, which she did, it's one thing. But to have Ruth Bader Ginsburg write the foreword to your book, well, that's pretty much everything. That is beautifully said. I, uh, I uh, actually walked past Ruth Bader Ginsburg a year to the day before she died. I walked mm -hmm. past her in, in uh, Washington uh, National Airport, I guess Reagan mm -hmm. Airport. I'll always call it Washington National Airport as is my habit. Uh, and I can't tell you how much I wanted to just race up and hug her, but I was afraid I would either break every bone in her body or the Secret Service, more likely, who right. were surrounding her would tackle me and right. tase me. <laughs> but, so, uh, you know, she, she speaking of giants, right? I mean, she was all of five foot tall, but she was absolutely a giant to so many people in this country and, and women in particular. And I, um, I, I feel, I actually said to my husband that I feel lucky to have been alive during this time because to, to see the path that she was able to carve both as a woman, as a legal scholar, as just a, 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 a feminist, as a justice, as all of it has been, uh, it's, it's been a, a, a real honor for me to witness wow what a what a tribute that is well that is really quite a tribute so uh, let's talk about we've got about uh seven minutes left let's talk about the end blindness campaign so uh you and sue created a at first a two million dollar gift which is now a three million dollar gift yeah. uh to be bestowed on december 14 upon the person group institution uh that is deemed to have made the greatest scientific and medical contribution towards advancing vision science for human patients how did this come about why did you decide that in 2012 that this was the moment to to create the end blindness by 2020 campaign well, as I mentioned to you, this started in a despairing hospital bed in Detroit. Yes. And what became clear to me shortly after I was able to stand on my own two feet was that science was really nowhere near to considering and making possible my dream that it was futile to pursue it then because people would think you were mad. Um, despite Albert Einstein saying that if the idea is not absurd, it's not worth pursuing. <laughs> That's terrific. And so, uh, but I, also had a few other things to do to build a family, build an enterprise. And reflect. But as the century ended, 
there were glimmerings of enormous scientific progress. And in 2010, I became the chairman of Board of Governors of the Johns Hopkins Wilmer Eye Institute that you kindly mentioned earlier. And I began examining from the inside where we stood scientifically. And with the ardent support of Peter McDonald, the director and other members of our Board of Governors, on November 4th, 2011, I stood up at the board meeting and announced that what we should be doing is to try and end blindness. And I said, end blindness within the next 2,978 days, because that was the time that it took Neil Armstrong to land on the moon in July 20th of 69. And Kennedy's announcement of it was May 25th, 61, a couple months after I went blind, which of course inspired me. And I reasoned that if we could go to the moon and return a man safely to earth, why simply couldn't we end blindness? Now, of course, there are many parallels and um, people could shoot holes in it, but I felt that was an aspirational goal, still do, inspirational promise to a new generation of people. And the challenge that Sue and I decided upon was to make an appeal to the most brilliant minds of this generation to focus and pay attention to figuring out how we could eliminate the scourge of blindness, which has afflicted humankind, as well as our bipedal ancestors for 6 million years. And when Justice Ginsburg and I agreed last night, the way to talk about the injustice of blindness was to hold the award ceremony in the Supreme Court on December 14th. And of course, COVID and the justices passing makes that impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, but we will award the prizes on December 14th. We have a, an extraordinary group of civic leaders as our National Governing Council and similarly, the most outstanding scientists that I know, 12 of them on our scientific advisory board, and they have been processing all this data from across the globe to select the individual or team of researchers that has done the most to end blindness for everyone and forevermore. I think that is uh, that is that is uh, such a it, it is it is a moonshot uh, worthy of our time. Um, I, I I I'm not sure if it's in poor taste, but I'm going to make the jig anyway. That it's probably okay that it's not on the Supreme Court because justice is blind after all. <laughs> <laughs> That's very well said. Very well said. Uh, I love the, the the story in the book about uh, meeting Dr. Jonas Salk, where you talked about it and you left there chanting, end it, end it, end it. And you're like, if Jack Kennedy could put a man on the moon and Jonas Salk could end polio, why, polio, why not a blind buffalo guy named Sandy Greenberg? There's your burden of potential right there. Yep. Why not? Why, why not? Why can't we end this? And we will. And we will. Thank you for your time today. Um, if you're interested in the book, you can go to hellodarkness-book.com. And to learn more about the quest to end blindness, you can go to endblindnessby2020.com. Dr. Greenberg, thank you for your time today. I, I, you are a wonderful storyteller. The book is fantastic. Why, thank you very much, Laura. It was a great pleasure being here with you. And I learned a hell of a lot. You gave me a great <laughs> tutorial, so I thank you. Well, you are very kind, and I'm going to uh, end this and text our mutual friend, Sandy Hoffman, and thank him for the introduction.
Um, give him my best. Thank you. Take Bye. care.